Welcome to Birkin Forest Monastery's live stream. I'm Ajahn Sona, and today we'll be, <clears throat> as usual, answering questions. And the questions are from all over the world. It's really very interesting uh, to see where they're coming from. And uh, this is the beauties, uh, beauty of the modern technology and the internet. And some of the questions have been pre-submitted, and some of them are in the live chat. So uh, do not be dismayed if your live question has is not answer, uh, answered. And also do not be dismayed uh, if it has been preserved for a week or so. Um, so it's a nice mixture. And we try to give a balanced uh, opportunity for questions on different topics. And these live streams are staying up um, indefinitely, so we uh, tidy them up a little bit at the end, take the intro and a few things out, and so we eventually get a bank of questions and answers. I think we've been doing this for about uh, seven or eight times now, a couple months, and we intend to continue, and each time we end up answering about uh, eight or ten or maybe eleven questions. So these questions are good for later audiences. Um, eventually, after we do a year of this, we're going to probably run into 500 questions and answers or so. And then uh, pretty well most people's inquiries will be available and you will have an opportunity to, to look back on these things as well. So this is our strategy in this uh, we have a kind of an overarching strategy. We're not just uh, blindly, uh, spontaneously reacting here. So um, I would like to go on to the first question, and it is by Pia, who is back from her holiday. Thank you, Ajahn. Our first question is from Lake in Portland, and this is from our live chat. Dear Ajahn, what does it mean to discuss and listen to the Dhamma at the right time or on timely occasions, as in the Mangala Sutta? Yes, part of um, right speech uh, is also knowing the right time to speak and the right time to ask a question and also the right time to listen. Maybe you see in the media these days uh, how inappropriate conversations are. They, a lot of interrupting each other, asking the wrong question at the wrong time, etc. So Dhamma, and, and one of the things, one of the criteria is that sometimes people don't go and get good information when they really need to. Uh, I think we all have that experience in our life when we think, you know, what was I thinking? Why didn't I just go and f ask somebody who knew? something, and I could have saved myself a lot of trouble. By the way, this is called knowing the water holes. <clears throat> and uh, the Buddha gives this simile of a, of a cattle herd, a, a sort of basically a cowboy. <laughs> you can imagine an Indian cowboy is, is really a boy walking around, <clears throat> keeping an eye on his cattle. And uh, one of the duties they have to be, keep them safe from predators, etc., and they have to know how to feed them. But they also need to know where the water holes are. And the water holes are just a simile, in the case of Dhamma, for wise people. You need to know. Uh, sometimes your doubts cannot be resolved by yourself. You remember that the fifth hindrance, the fifth psychic irritant, is doubt. And uh, there are proper doubts to have and to be locked in a state of suspended judgment because you can't decide, um, even in the best state of mind, then the next strategy is to go and ask some, a wise person, somebody knowledgeable in the field that you're, uh, un, un, you're doubtful about. So <clears throat> that's, you need a collection of this information source. And that could be senior monks, it could be wise lay teachers, it might even be your own parents or something like this if they're wise and have experience. So 
this is the idea of timeliness, is to, you know, get used to the idea that other people know things and that you can save yourself a lot of time and, and wrong ideas by, by consulting and, and getting good advice. Um, about going, uh, you know, this, uh, as we have the internet now, and this talk, for instance, will be available long into the future, and you can listen to it at 2, in, 2 a.m., or 2 p.m., but in the days of the Buddha, it was a one-to-one -one personal interaction with, with a monk, for instance, and you had to find the right time to go there. It would be not five minutes before they have to go on alms round, or late at night when they have other things to do. So you find the right time, <clears throat> and there was a, a kind of a opportunity always on the full moon and new moon, lay people were quite welcomed in the monastery for a full evening of Dhamma and the opportunity to ask questions and get answers. And so that would be an ideal time, a good place. The monks also went daily into the villages on alms round. And sometimes people thought, well, I'll ask them now, but Quite often that's the wrong time to be asking that the monk is, has a duty to go and collect their food and so forth and it may be the inappropriate to stop them in the street and start a conversation about uh, these questions. So it's kind of like a sense of timing on your behalf so that you're able to absorb the information that you're paying attention, it's appropriate for you and also appropriate for the person who is being ask the question. And as I say, this modern technology that we have is, is very lovely because you can, uh, you can uh, customize your, um, your quest to your own needs. And I am perpetually available up in cyberspace to uh, answer these questions. So <clears throat> that's, in brief, a little answer to that question. Let us go on, Pia. Ajahn, our next question is also live from Beyblade in India. Which of the two unskillful qualities are more, are more harmful? Avija, ignorance, or tanha, craving? Also, what is the most effective antidote to tanha? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, a good, very good question. And the Buddha, tanha is uh, thirst, craving. Avijja is ignorance. And both of these are sometimes given as the cause of suffering. In the Four Noble Truths, sometimes the root cause of suffering is given as tanha, uh, meant to be sort of craving, which keeps one in the realms of samsara, of existence, in a, in a problematic way. And avijja, which is the ignorance which... Uh, keeps you in uh, samsara. <laughs> now, we must say, though, and the Buddha gives it, sometimes he ta says tanha, sometimes he says avijja, but ultimately it has to have its root. All problems have their roots in ignorance or simple lack of knowledge. You simply don't know the skillful thing to do. And of the two, now, the, so you, you regularly hear about greed, hatred, and delusion, the three unskillful roots. And on the other side, you hear about generosity, kindness, and clarity. And so the Buddha talks about greed, hatred, and delusion. And he says that greed, thirst, desire, is a... Uh, is a lesser stain on the personality, and but very hard to get rid of. Anger or hatred is a great stain on the personality, but easier to get rid of than desire. And avijja or ignorance is a great stain on the personality and very difficult to get rid of. So you can see that the 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 worst one, the most problematic one, is avijja. And it's really hard to get rid of because 
it's primarily the, it's the absence of knowledge. And we also call this delusion. And in the case of delusion, you cannot see your own delusions. And so that's why they're hard to get rid of. You, you can't see it's a delusion. If, it, if you could see that it was delusion, it wouldn't be a delusion. Delusions are really good at disguising themselves as reality. <laughs> so of the two, so tanha is easier to get rid of than the uh, avija. And it is also, it is less problematic in its form as desire, in the form of desire. Now, tanha has a wider meaning than pure desire. So um, it, it, can, it can form uh, the, a, a desire to get rid of something as well. Whereas there's a form of desire where it means that you want things. And that's the customary idea. That that's the customary explanation. Desire is something I want. But there's also another form of desire, which is desire is some, uh, what, I, what I don't want. I want something to go away. <clears throat> anyway, these are, uh, this is a good examination. How do you get rid of avijja? You get rid of avijja and it's not mere ignorance. It's not mere lack of knowledge because you will never get ultimately, you'll never know everything. So it's not merely technical knowledge that you're looking for. And avijja is not mere, the mere absence of technical knowledge. It's the absence of the deep and important knowledge of the cause of suffering and how to get rid of it. So the way it's, it's, it has emotional roots in it and the secondary effects are greed and anger. The secondary effects of delusion or avijja is greed and anger. And these are the sort of primary problems. You get, you can actually recognize, you, you know when you have desire and you know when you're angry. So they're nice because you can see them. And so you attempt, you work on attenuating them, reducing their strength. You, when you recognize them, you, you attempt to prevent them first and then remove them if they, they occur. And then thirdly, to, to replace them with positive non-greed, say generosity and kindness. The more generosity and kindness is present, the less opportunity for uh, greed and hostility is available. And so the less time they're present, the weaker they become. The more time they're present, when greed and anger are present, they actually strengthen and become habitual. And so you're, you're feeding its root, which is avijja. You're feeding the ignorance which greed and hatred are based on. And if you want to starve your avijja, you want to starve your primary delusion and ignorance around how, why you suffer, you, you don't feed them with greed and anger which are visible to you. You can see those. Instead, you feed in generosity and kindness. And this attenuates, reduces the strength and, and confusion of your avijja, your ignorance. And suddenly you become, start to become knowledgeable, which is vija. You start to replace your ignorance with knowledge. Knowledge of how things arise, how <clears throat> unskillful emotions are created and how they're prevented and removed, and how beautiful emotions come in their place. So that's briefly an explanation. And by the way, that's the essence of what is called dependent origination, um, which I won't go into any depth on at the moment. So Pia, shall we ask the next question? Ajahn, our next question is from John in Twickenham, Middlesex, United Kingdom. What is the difference between equanimity as a balanced, engaged response within daily life compared to equanimity as an exalted state, e.g. the seventh factor of awakening, the fourth Brahma-vihara, etc.? Well, the difference is primarily that one is similar, the first one is similar to 
the balance required during when surfing or skiing or roller skating or any of the kind of active sports. You need balance in the midst of uh, all kinds of gravity changing experiences. Somehow, if you watch these surfers or skiers, it's quite amazing that they are perfectly centered in the midst of radical changes uh, around them. And this is the kind of equanimity that we're talking about in daily life. The equanimity of the seventh factor and also of the fourth jhana. So the, let me just define jhana. Not everybody is familiar with all these terms and lots of people watch this uh, question and answer period. So jhana is deep states of samadhi, almost, un, almost unknown in ordinary Western literature and even in contemplative practices. Uh, this the depth of stillness and uh, clarity and emotional transformation, which is described in these jhanas, the eighth factor of the eightfold path, uh, is almost unknown to the West. And so there's quite a bit of uh, descriptions and and uh, conversation around this to introduce uh, people who are not immersed in the Buddhist tradition to what this means. So the equanimity which rises in the fourth jhana and is also the, the nature of the seventh factor of enlightenment is uh, can be a more like balancing uh, a broom on on the uh, the on its handle on the end of your nose. So in this case it's not about motion it's about stillness and very a great deal of stillness and a very great deal of precision and um, by the way you can start with balancing the broomstick on the palm of your hand. Notice that uh, it's not about gripping the broomstick it's about keeping your hand open and the butt of the broomstick in your hand and then you will find if you're not practiced at this that the the thing wants to topple over and you have to move your hand around in order to keep the center of balance but eventually if you do this well it can be almost still in the center of your palm without gripping it so this is the kind of mind state that you're cultivating in, in focused equanimity and a great deal of stillness I think overall I believe there's something between 9 and 11 types of equanimity uh, listed in the suttas. But we can summarize them as basically what we, the sterling quality of a person who is balanced in the midst of success and failure, praise and blame, obscurity and fame, good fortune and bad fortune. That is a character trait a person manages and doesn't doesn't get carried away when they're praised and doesn't become dejected in, in blame. And then the other form is the capacity of a human to still their own mind to such an extent. And this is really a form of super normal focus, uh, lucidity, balance. Um, and uh, this is the other type of equanimity. Both are absolute gems in uh, contributing to your own well-being and also the beings around you. Lots of people benefit, you know, they benefit greatly from being around balanced people. And unbalanced people can really upset the people around them as well and communicate a sense of panic and distress, which can be very unhelpful. So this is a in brief uh, description. By the way, you should, um, I have given extensive talks on equanimity. In fact, I gave a whole, I think more than one retreat, I think about 11 talks or something like that <laughs> on equanimity. I gave a whole retreat on equanimity and you very rarely encounter that and it's all recorded on the channel. So please indulge in, and hear 11 talks on equanimity. Okay, let's go to our next question, Pia. 
Ajahn, this next question is from Irma in Penticton, British Columbia, Canada. Please advise me how to explain to a four-year-old why his beloved great-grandfather will not be coming back from the hospital to his usual chair. Yes, thank you for the question, Irma. And uh, so, when did, I think it's good to expose children to reality early, but quite especially with death, um, it it shouldn't be presented as a terrible thing or a terrible tragedy or anything like this. More like they'll they'll want to know where where they've gone, and basically it's on a journey. And uh, so that's a, that's a version of defining what death is. And I think uh, a child's mind can understand that. And uh, usually if a person just vanishes and there's no explanation, it leaves the person absolutely mystified. The child is mystified. So it's better that, you know, to say, well, it's kind of like changing your clothes. You know, you, when you get to a certain age, your body needs to be changed. You get new clothes. And the four-year-old will understand this because last they can't fit into the clothes from last year. They, they're no longer three. They put on 10 pounds, and they're, they can't fit into the clothes. So you get rid of those clothes, and then you have new clothes. Huh? And you can also point out to them that their body is changing rapidly. And they're, they're learning new things, and they're... They're about to go off to school as well. So these are all journeys and radical changes. Not to be too feared, but to be understood. So this is a story um, about life. It's a skillful story. I had uh, such questions myself when I was four, and I asked my mother all about such matters. She gave me very good answers. And uh, now I must say to the audience in general that Irma from Penticton is my mother. And uh, she's asking about my father who just died. And she's trying to um, uh, communicate this to a four-year-old who is the great-grandchild <laughs> of my father. <laughs> so I'm very happy. And uh, I... I think I hope you're all delighted that my mother has submitted a question and that I've answered it and that uh, she's here and uh, brings up this very touching and important uh, issue of death and the explanation for children and um, and also of course not just for children it's it's the question everybody has ultimately nobody can deny there's a question there's, there's a quote from Emerson, who was a philosopher, also a, a, uni a United Church minister, I think, or a Unitarian-based minister in, and famous uh, in, in the Americas in the 1830s and 40s. And um, he said, said to, he, he would often hear, go to hear other people preach and so forth. And he said, Whenever they talk about death, they always start quoting, <laughs> tell us what you really know. <laughs> so this is something that we must frankly admit most people don't really know, but they quote. But it's something that is very important, isn't it? It will come to all of us. And if it's possible to know anything, I think it's a good use of one's time to know about this. How shall we approach it? How shall we think about it? What is it? What does it mean to us? How shall we talk about it with other people? So this is very, very important. The essence, as the Buddha says, the king of meditations. Death is the king of meditations. Okay, next question, please. Pia. Ajahn, this question is from Just This in Victoria, Australia. I've heard it said that, quote, you can't remove the saltiness from salt, unquote. What does this mean in relation to sensual pleasures? Well, sensual pleasures are 
require two parts. One, the object and the subject. So each person experiences these things differently. Some people find great pleasure in in certain things, and there's there's certain things that are sort of universally regarded as pleasurable, but you'll always find certain people who do not take pleasure in those things. They Sometimes they're actually repulsive to them or neutral. And so there's, there's always uh, two parts to this idea of pleasure. Uh, and so, but the essence of it is, is that Ordinary people's happiness comes from the experience of, of pleasures. And, uh, and the Buddha is not necessarily a wet blanket on this. He says, if you're not going to cultivate the higher mind and aspire to detachment from these things, which is a higher pleasure in itself, uh, of the two, like this, the worldly pleasures of sights and sounds, smells, taste, touches, and even ideas, interesting ideas, all of the lovely, the, the music and the, the romance and the drama and the food and the dancing and the singing and all this kind of stuff are what normally people recall as, as happiness. They, it helps them be happy. The Buddha is not rejecting this as evil or anything. He's just saying, you don't know the half of it. There's even better pleasures than that. But it means that you have to withdraw your, your attention from those sources. And so many people can't even conceive of starting to withdraw from that. That's the only reason for being alive. So there's a, there's a number of ways of understanding this. If you find alternative ways of well-being, characteristic of this is the falling away of, of strong interest in, in uh, the sensory realm, the sensual realm. When I say the sensual realm, it's more like the, si the senses of, of sight, sound, smells, taste, touches, and ideas. Uh, you will see certain contemplative around the world and in history but strangely, they don't seem to be uh, pursuing this very much. They're, they're withdrawing from this. Uh, this is also a characteristic of madness as well. <laughs> so uh, if, there are various people who are, have mental illnesses, and there's various people who are... So they're, they're not normal, subnormal in some ways, and then there are people who are supernormal, and they, they leave behind the preoccupation with the sensory and the sensual happiness, and they go to, but they're not deprived, and they're not just trying to see how long they can hold out with, from it. They're not in a state of craving and desire that, that is unfulfilled. They're actually in a state of great ease and peace, but they're getting their source of happiness from another level of the game. And it is up, the Buddha encourages anybody who wants to try it to, to try to find the next level of the game but it means that you have to leave the sensual preoccupation behind in order to do this. So these are two realms. Uh, and the Buddha says that of the, 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 upper, the higher realm is, is, is the greater of these two realms. So a little bit about that. Next question, Pia. Ajahn, this question is from Anonymous in the United States. There are decisions I have made in my life which I had a strong intuition that I should be doing s something different. One such decision was leaving a city I really loved to look for similar experiences elsewhere, which I did not find. I sometimes find myself ruminating on whether my life may have been happier, different, if I had made different decisions. During our meta retreat this winter, you encouraged us to think of our past selves as, quote, characters in a story, unquote, and more as dominoes knocking into each other than a little pinball moving through time. This has helped, but I sometimes still catch myself in painful ruminating. Is there a specific meditation technique I should rely on during these times? Or any other advice or thoughts you may have on this? Yes, uh... <clears throat> 
the only problem about memory, there's no problem about going back over your life and, and investigating and trying to learn from things and asking yourself whether it would have been better to do it a different way. That's not a problem. It's the pain that's the problem. So when we bring up a useless emotion like, why couldn't I have not done that? I wish I hadn't done that. All kind of, these, of course, there's no amount of wishing that makes the past change. Whatever, whatever happened, happened. And the things that might have happened that would have been maybe more conducive to your happiness didn't. <laughs> so you got to say, this, this thing has been told. It's a story already told. There are no revisions possible. You fi you've, you've done your final essay and submitted it. It's too late. You can't do any more revisions. It's done. Uh, now is the time not to uh, in introduce any uh, regret over this. But to it's okay to inquire, could it have been done more skillfully? Have I learned anything? Can I learn anything from this? And so that's the spirit. So if you... I would say that you should not uh, go into your memory unprepared. So before you go researching your life, you have to prepare it with a sense of both kindness and compassion and equanimity so that you're willing to read this as a story and a story which is edifying or is going to teach you something. As when we read novels, we, we hope that it's great novels teach us. And the characters are sometimes put through the ringer. And we see, I see how humans make errors of judgment. I see that. Hmm, very interesting. I must watch out for that. And I see also how people come to happiness, how they change from being uh, in an aversive temperament to a more kindly temperament and the dramatic change in their life, how that beautifies their life. Hmm, I must learn this lesson. I must. Very good. I'm glad I read that novel. But the other novel is always available as your own life, where the character is also. Nobody goes through life without confrontations and, and changes. The Buddha is a prime example of this. He's, he's a dramatically, he's several times on the wrong track. He falls in with the wrong crowd. He's dismayed at the types of uh, quality of life in the palace, and then he falls in with some people who are very harsh on themselves and their bodies, and then he says, enough of this, and he becomes a much wiser and kinder human and, and, and also tells everybody, don't waste your time with these extremes. You know, There is a way through to well-being and happiness. Here's an example from my life, how I made mistakes and how I saw my way through. So this is, uh, this is what we should be doing when we review our lives. And um, so bring a sense of humor as well and um, be uh, perfectly prepared to uh, look at the 16-year-old or 18-year-old that did embarrassing things without embarrassment because you are not that person. That person is more or less, even if, if it's the 38-year-old that did something <laughs> embarrassing, went on a credit card spree. <laughs> That's, that's your younger brother or your younger sister. And in fact, uh, being connected to you, you're going to have to pay off your foolish younger brother's debts. <laughs> um, so we are not the one that went on the spree. We are the one, though, that must pay off the debts on, uh, from the spree. So this is one way to look at it. This is a helpful way to look at it. Let us go on to the next question. Ajahn, our next question is live from Zola in South Africa. May you please talk about the dangers of conceit in the, Buddha, in the Buddhist spiritual practice and how to overcome it? Yes, the, the conceit that is referred to is really just a sense of self, uh, where self, the sense of self is a problem. Um, and usually, for instance, like, Let's talk about comparisons. So we compare ourselves to others and we feel 
inferior to them, or we feel superior to them, or we sometimes we feel equal to them. Sometimes we're congratulated. It's endless motivations to do this, but it's very painful because you can't always be the one that's superior to everybody. And uh, so this, the, the Buddha is saying, you, you know, you can abandon this whole fruitless exercise of comparing yourself and creating a sense of self. And as you, you are unique. You are an individual with a lot of history. And there are reasons why you are as you are. And the person beside you, even if they're your identical twin, has slightly different influences. You could, you could be um, genetically identical twins with somebody, and you will see change happens over time. Differences happen over time. You are not identical with any other being in the universe. Isn't that amazing? You are unique. And there's reasons because of causes and effects in your, in your body and your mind. So we, we look at it this way, and, and by that we dissolve the obsession about this, this sense of conceit or self. Conceit, by the way, is a, it can be very, very mild, uh, or it can be very, very strong. As you see, people who are, uh, you can smell it from a, a mile away when somebody's really conceited. But conceit, in this, in this, once you, in the spiritual dimension, can be very, very, very mild but there's a trace of a sense of self. Even the, the trace of the sense of self that says, I'm enlightened. Uh, there's a certain personalization of this. And so this is one of the last things to go. It's a, what we call amongst the last five fetters or chains which bind a person. And you can be quite exalted in your in your spiritual development and still have a ta just a trace of this sense of self as and it's referred to in, in English as conceit it's probably not the best word for it because it, it tends to make you think of somebody who's a real pain in the butt that's obnoxious but it's it can be the mildest sense of of uh, of a self so this is the nature of this uh, of conceit, and it's the last. It's uh, to uproot it completely is the last stage of enlightenment. So, it's uh, it's a job, but the uh, ordinary person, even before the first stage of enlightenment, can do great things in terms of reducing their sense of self consciousness and and having to compete and compare with the rest of the world, and find out what a what a wonderful unburdening it is to not have to to always be comparing and, uh, and seeking um, the, the higher, the, the better hand uh, over other people. So, let's move on again, Pia. Ajahn, our next question is live from Sun Tzu. I find the chant, Om Mani Padme Hum, makes me stay mindful longer than watching the breath or listening to a sound. Is that as good as the chant or for mindfulness? Um, that's a uh, chant quite often used in the Tibetan schools. Um, in the Theravada school in uh, Thailand, there's a, a kind of a, a simple mantra as well, which is simply the word Buddho, with an O on the end rather than A, Buddho. And it's given out regularly as well. And I, I think as a as a more or less a general uh, a general anchor and help for people around in a village, maybe not a uh, a meditator, or a monk, or something. Uh, but some of the monks use use the symbol word Buddha as well, uh, and it it seems to be very important to them. Uh, I would say, though, that, you know, the f this uh, requires, if you're from a, a faith culture, if the very word Buddha is laden with meaning and rich emotions to you, it can be very powerful. Uh, a lot of uh, the Westerners who come to Buddhism come late in life, 
and they're not raised around Buddha images and chanting and things like that. So it, it doesn't have much emotional weight to it. The word Buddha doesn't resonate. I mean, if you take a Christian who's been born and raised in a Christian family and all of the Christmases and all this kind of stuff, and you say, Jesus Christ, it, it has a lot, it's loaded with uh, all kinds of emotional dimension, Jesus or Jesus Christ. And, uh, and it, it's triggering. And it's, but if, if you're from a, a non-Christian culture and you've hardly ever heard of, the, of it, it means nothing to you. It doesn't have any deep resonance, so it can't emotionally grip you. So this is a matter of like, does this chant, Om Mani Padme Hum, does that grip you? Does that, uh, is it got a lot of uh, meaning and upliftment for you? And, and if that case, it, it works for you. I mean, you might want to try letting it go at some point and just going straight to the breath, which is devoid of all sounds and words and has a very different, it's a very, it's a demanding uh, meditation, breath meditation, very demanding. Its primary benefit is actually to let go of the the inner voice, the inner churning of ideas and words that the mind continuously does, and which is also obnoxious at the same time. When it when anybody talks too much, it's obnoxious. So breath meditation is the antidote to excessive discursive that discourse, conversational, inner conversation. It's too much inner talking. How do we get out of this? The Buddha proposes, you use the breath because there's nothing to say about air. There's nothing to say about breath. And when you find yourself drifting or talking, stop, bring it back to the breath. So this is the function of that. It can be preceded by the chanting, and quite often throughout all Buddhist cultures, lots of chanting happens, and it, it, it massages the mind and brings it to a quieter state. And you, a lot of people can access peaceful states by chanting a lot, who have great difficulty accessing peace through the, the breath. So it's it's just it's a form it's it's more it's a stronger brain massage, <laughs> mind massage by chanting, rituals, bowing and all this kind of stuff is are quite often helpful for calming the mind, and not to be either thought as as the ultimate thing or rejected. That that happens in when people are coming to Buddhism from having read things they. They're very surprised to find out there are rituals and chanting and so forth. These are mere st helps or processes along the way that help you get to a state of peaceful mind. And then, then the key and the goal is to have let your understanding arise. Sometimes the mind is too busy for understanding to arise. So we're trying to calm it down, strengthen it so that it can focus and understand. So that's a little talk on, on that. Next question, Pia. Ajahn, our next question is from Jonathan Rowe in Stockholm, Sweden. I, I'm sorry. Um, my question is regarding renunciation. I live a semi-monastery life where I don't participate a lot in social gatherings, but try to study Buddhism and do my practice instead. The hardest thing for me right now is the feeling of isolation. How was it for you in those years in the cottage to be alone for such a long time? And how did you deal with feelings of loneliness and isolation if you had these? Thank you. Yes, understand. And this is something, you know, I have to be kind to yourself and not, and treat yourself with some delicacy. Sometimes we get very, very enthusiastic about the spiritual path and we want to go off and be a hermit just like you've read about. <laughs> and uh, the reason why there aren't so many hermits in history or now is because it's a, it's a kind of a, it's not natural to humans. Uh, humans are social creatures. They like to be around other humans and, and their pets and so forth. They have a social persona and 
be aware that this is a very deep conditioning. And in order to rise above that, to actually have the independence, to, to be happy in solitude, to be well and happy and in sustained long solitude is, is a super normal. This is a, a special power. Uh, it's not available to people. You see peop uh, in prisons, of course, to be put in solitude is a terrible kind of uh, punishment <laughs> for these prisoners, and some of them go out of their minds and so forth. So uh, it, it has, it reflects a person's development almost to the degree that a person can be well, happy, peaceful, complete, satisfied, in solitude is where they are on the scale of human development and just to the degree that people cannot have a moment alone that they're terrified of being alone is shows the lack of development and cultivation it goes extreme on the other end of the spectrum where not only can people not be alone but they can't be with people either so they can't be with people and they can't be without people because their own inner structure is so confused and violent and, and full of angst, etc. So they're rejected. They, they end up being rejected by society and forced into a extreme loneliness because they're confronted with their own troubled mind. And they, they can't get... Um, they're not allowed to associate with others. Nobody likes them. <laughs> so you can see this is the spectrum. So assess yourself. Say, I am headed, I'm, I'm aspiring to an exalted superhuman condition of being pleased with solitude. But never, never let me mistake it that I have, it's not that I have to do this. Um, it's something that I, I can learn to some degree to do, and I might fail at it because it's a very high, demanding thing to do. And when I feel lonely and so forth, that, uh, of course, that's to be expected. That is why we have monast a monastery, a sang sangha. So monks don't just arrive and then sent off into solitude. They're actually in community for an extended period of time. In fact, if, if, if required for the rest of their life, they stay in community. Not everybody's cut out to, to actually be able to be in solitude. So many monks spend, spend many years before they try extended solitary retreats, they spend years with the community, learning to meditate, uh, how, how to cooperate with others, etc., learning about their own mind, constantly asking questions and getting getting answers from experienced teachers. And then they have an opportunity. Was, Let me try solitude. They'll ask their teacher, can I go off and try some solitude? And they may find, uh, to much to their surprise, that they're, it's not good, um, that they're not ready for it. And then they come back, and it's quite understood. You know, if, you, if it's not going well, come back to the community and we'll, we'll work more. And sometimes it... It works out well. But it's a very exalted thing, so expect it to be difficult and be very careful with yourself not to overdo it and also to understand that there are spiritual communities which are helpful to you. It's not Solitude is not necessity always. It's, it's something that may, it may flower for you, but you, a spiritual community can be very helpful in the journey towards that. Okay, next question, Pia. Ajahn, our next question is from Chad in Kelowna, BC, Canada. Ajahn, could you explain how we can live with anatta in mind in a culture that is so focused on actualizing the self? Yes, um, be prepared to be misunderstood. Um, it's a good sign, actually. Uh, if you're uh, well understood and well accepted uh, by the mainstream of society, there's you probably have need to work harder. <laughs> you, you're, 
the idea of anatta, which is selflessness, like a sense, not only the, the, I think, you know, so, so if you ask a physicist about the self, like a human self, they might be inclined to say, well, there isn't, there, there is no self as a, as an unchanging entity. It's all the flashing electrons of the brain or something like this, you know. So I, you know, a, a materialist uh, point of view can easily understand that all of the processes of the mind and body are just, are just that, they're just processes. And that the self is, a, is an imaginative creation. But many people uh, in a religious culture have this idea of a kind of a, 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 a absolutely I, self that doesn't change through time and is, is a immortal somehow. And this is a leftover from, uh, from Christianity and, and various ideas and, and just ordinary social. You end up endless talk about the self and how to improve yourself. But uh, this, this concept of anatta where there's the Buddha is saying something rather startling that there is no self, there is no actual your your who you think you are is not a thing, but there are processes, and you should you will be helped by understanding everything's a process because then you can you can change it any way you want. The processes remain, but the idea the wrong idea that it's a thing, not a process, is what drops away. By the way, the self is. Never, the self never disappears. There, there never was one to disappear. It's just your, your view of things. This happens in science where what appeared to be a solid object on closer examination turns out to be mostly empty space and a few atoms whirling around. And then when they examine atoms, it turns out they're mostly empty space whirling around and they investigate those and they turn into wavicles and then it kind of vanishes <laughs> into something indefinable and inconceivable and so this happens in all areas of life and we, we would benefit this is a very early realization from great thinkers that the what we regard as a thing uh, a solid item turns out not to be a solid item, but a, f a flowing process. And we are also that. And that's liberating. It's very liberating to, because you can change the process to, to a skillful form. You can go anywhere from where you are. It's beautiful. Now, ordinary, to, to bring this up in a cocktail party <laughs> or at the pizza hut <laughs> is just plain, usually just, a waste of your time. You you won't get comprehension. You understand how how difficult the ideas are in this, and how even for ourselves, when we want to understand it, it's still it's still a hard idea to grasp. So I would just say not to try to not to expect people to understand, and understand that you are by contemplating this object, you are. You are going to the margins of where people understand about the self. So you, you will be alone. <laughs> Not lonely, but you will be marginalized. Okay, maybe one last question, Pia. Ajahn, our final question is from the live chat from Prasadika. Ajahn, I feel that the sense of competition that society instills at a very early age is a big impediment to developing the heart qualities. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, I would pronounce it prasadika. Maybe, am I right or is Pia right? <laughs> uh, I don't know. So, uh, competition, yes, very problematic. Uh, this is the essence of, uh, we were talked earlier about conceit and how we develop this. We're a comparative mind. So I'm better than you, I'm equal to you, I'm worse than you. Uh, actually, all 
everybody is simply unique and there is no comparison. You should compare yourself to your past, um, but even then, there's no point in it because you can't be who you were. <laughs> so, however, however, the truth is that you are unique at every moment in time and you are incomparable. And to compete with somebody else is a strange idea because you can't be somebody else and they can't be you. Therefore, where is the competition? <laughs> the more you enjoy this, the more you will be free. By the way, you can exercise this as well. Indulge in failure, fail, deliberately failing sometimes. Enjoy failing, enjoy coming forth, <laughs> enjoy coming last. Um, people arrive at this. This is part of the spiritual thing where, you know, everybody else is, their happiness is hinging on winning, so, you know, let them win, <laughs> let them win. <laughs> um, it's not that we can't do things. There's a very interesting little school um, in California. It's part of a monastery called the, the City of 10,000 Buddhas. And it's a, it's a Mahayana meditation uh, monastery, very close to one uh, of our monasteries called Abhayagiri. And that is a large monastery. And they have, they have uh, not quite a few nuns and monks, and, uh, and they have a school for, for children, grades 1 to 12, and then they also have a university graduate school as well. And the nuns and monks teach these classes uh, sometimes. And there are also uh, strict vegetarians there. And they, they, they talk humorously about having been exposed to the Buddha's uh, great emphasis on compassion, which is part of the Mahayana idea, and, and humility that when they have class, when they have elections for class president, they find out that people are voting for the other guy. They're, they're running for office and voting for the other guy. <laughs> so they had to say to them, no, it's all right. You can, you can vote for yourself. You can, you can make a good campaign to get elected. It doesn't mean that, that you're less compassionate or anything like that. You're not, it doesn't mean that you're comparative or competitive. You just do it. And the person who loses should also not be offended or feel that they need to compare themselves or regret that they didn't get first place this time. So it's very funny that they took, it took a long time before the, 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 they would stop voting for their, their opponent. <laughs> They also have a soccer team, and the soccer team, I asked them about this, I was in, I was down there, the soccer team is all, all children, all vegetarians, and I say, well, how, how they do, you know, in, a, in competition, they uh, say, well, they've, they've uh, actually never lost a game. <laughs> and, oh, really? Wow, it's a perfect record. In fact, they've never been scored on. <laughs> So the, uh, there's not the comp it's not a competitive spirit. It's simply focus and clarity and mindfulness and presence, and um, and it has it has very very effective. But it's it's not by trying to win that you win. You, it, no amount of trying to win makes you win. And this is this is the to up. To turn to overturn almost every coach's ideas. That's not how things are done. And every student in university, I, I often give them this. It's not by wanting to succeed in your exams. It's not by hoping, wanting, or anything like that. It's simply by study and do it. Your emotions have nothing to do with the results on your exam. Simply study, remember, understand, write the exam. Don't hope, don't want, don't try, just do. So that's the, it, the explanation around this business about competition. And we have come to the end of our 
hour. And uh, we wish you well. I hope that you can benefit from some of these things. And I also want to wish well to my mother who asked the question. And uh, I hope that the explanation for the four-year-old great-grandchild um, is a success. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>